Aloha. Hey. Good to see you. Oh. Oh, Malia. The little one. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> oh, it's great to see you. Oh, little one, joy. <laughs> well, welcome everybody. As usual, feel free to take a look around, see who else is here with us today. Ah, wonderful. Oh, great. Okay, well, Steve will get us started with some instructions today. wherever, however you're sitting, how does that feel? What does sitting feel like from within the sitting posture? Aware that sitting is happening, knowing sitting from within without the contours, the form, particular, particularly the actuality of streaming energies, textures, pressures, oscillation, pulsation, don't forget to include the head as part of body awareness or by habit we may have the perspective that we're observing the body from the head. Whereas when we include that lump between our shoulders, it's just like observing hands, feet, knees, hips, learning what it feels like with a, a global awareness, like a camera aperture open wide to feel the whole bodily streaming system, head to toe, in one sweep of awareness, as well as your grounding touchstones, the feet, the hands, sit bones, solar plexus, for the first few minutes, why don't we call up a Brahma Vihara, the one that feels immediate close to the heart, close to awareness. And the sense of just letting go into it, abiding in the awareness 
of metta or karuna, mudita. The even mindedness of upeka. One or two Brahma Viharas. Just let them sit, if you like, around the solar plexus area and notice what their effect is on the on the body awareness we were just doing together. Both the global awareness of the entire streaming body sensations or those touchstones that we count on for anchoring or groundedness, hands, feet, sit bones, solar plexus and as if we're breathing in the nectar of the Brahma Vihara the nectar of kindness of care, the nourishing nectar of empathetic joy. And the nectar of profound, refined stability, balance, imperturbability just knowing they're all within our body within the heart and the brush strokes Brahma Vihara brush strokes soothing to the system, calming to the mind. Relaxing to our systems. Inviting any or all of the Brahma Viharas to come along for the journey as we begin to be aware of what is apparent and appearing through any of the sense doors, visual play of light and shadow color and form. Sound, curtain. Of white noise or particular sound vibrations. Recognizing when we can their individual unique natures like the notes of a plain symphony that appear with others and fall away moment to moment with silence following. Noticing when we're aware of these 
sense phenomena of light and sound, fragrance, body sensation, the very touch of awareness on these apparent and appearing phenomena is often itself self-soothing and self-integrating, not apart, not separate. from the here and now process that we are. Every so often just seeing what a conscious in-breath feels like as the, as the nectar of oxygen reaches every point. Throughout the body, every sensation, every neuron, and is thus nurtured by that. How does that feel, that full breath? followed by the exhalation. How does it feel from within that very breathing process? Such a natural intake and expulsion requiring no hesitation or force or direction. Just the intelligence of breath, breathing itself, of body, being body, and of mind, just being mind, knowing, stream of knowing. at the six sense doors. So with interest, openness, curiosity, Just let the knowing awareness follow along now in the silence.
Thank you, Steve. Ada, I love your hair. I don't, is that your normal hair color or is it a Halloween hair color? What? Yeah. Oh, it's my normal one. That's awesome. That's so cool. And, uh, <laughs> one of my best friends is a hairdresser, so she keeps pushing me to go more and more vibrant. I'm inspired. Yeah. <laughs> Last year, I remember we, at the very last minute, I think I tried to encourage people to do like to dress up for Halloween for our Zoom, but it, and like five of us did it or something. But anyway, it's inspired. It, I'm also I feel like a resolution for next year. We're gonna try that again. <laughs> Everyone has a year to plan for what costume you'll wear to our Halloween Zoom. If we're all still around. Mm. Um, it's not a particularly Halloweeny talk today, but I it is, it is um in some ways in terms of death and the macabre and the um, mysterious realms. Uh, that we sometimes find ourselves in, in terms of the mind and the body. Sometimes when I am traveling, um, I will kind of wake up in the middle of the night and not know where I am. I don't know exactly what the confluence of con conditions are for that, but uh, it's jet lag probably and being in a different bedroom. Um, I think often it needs to be very dark for that to happen. So like when I wake up, there's not the kind of normal immediate sort of references that the mind makes and the story sort of like clicks back in. And when that, I think when it first, you know, started happening, um, it's not that often and it has been a while since it's happened, but because I was traveling recently, it occurred to me as something that may happen. You know, when I first remember that happening, there's something very scary about it, a sense of that disorientation um, of not knowing where I was and how strange it felt and, and wanting to really kind of claw back uh, some sense of kind of familiarity and stability and reassurance of knowing where I was. And over time, as that kind of maybe got more familiar, I started to see that that sometimes it wasn't just that I didn't know where I was, that I could wake up in the dark. And also, I didn't know who I was. And that that, of course, was kind of more disturbing, you know, more unsettling. Uh, and, and sort of bizarre. And again, sort of like would sort of jump to kind of like finding the the thread of storyline that would sort of recompose myself and my position and where I was and what was happening and really kind of re rediscovering the story of who I was and where I was in that moment. And over time, I've come to not feel such a need to do that and have had some experiences more recently where if I wake up and I, and I, it's clear that I don't know, you know, where I am or, or who I am of, of not rushing to get back to something more familiar of really allowing myself to sort of be in that space and feel what it's like to just abide there, to just kind of hang out. And then amazingly to watch sort of slowly how, um, even if I don't want it to, this more familiar storyline kind of like 
arises, right? And sort of just becomes, it comes out of, <laughs> out of the darkness, this sort of coherence and this solidity um, of, of who I am and where I am. And, and it is interesting to see the ways in which, in some ways, the, that I, the, the experience can feel so unique and interesting now that I, I, I don't want that to happen. I feel like, oh, I see this sort of solidity of meanness and the kind of like confines of it sort of come back together in a way that it's like, like oh, no, no, I don't, I don't need to know. I was like, okay, right. Uh, it kind of re-arises. But that sense of the, the freedom of not having my identity or my position or anything about existence be so um, confined to uh, a kind of mental conditioning and, and mental structures that I'm that I see that I'm constantly composing, you know, and it's something that, of course, we see in our daily lives, you see in our meditation practice, this way that we're just like, we're so invested in rehearsing ourselves, who we are, our ideas, our opinions, our beliefs, our stories, what we like, what we don't like, um, what we want, what we don't want you know, this, we're, we're always kind of constellating ourselves in the world together in ways that are amazing, right? The structures and the scaffolding of self and of the world that we create in the mind and the heart. And yet also as yogis, we see the, the kind of habitual and um, anxiety behind some of that, the, the, the relentlessness of it, the addiction to it the sense of, oh, just wanting to follow the breath or just wanting to listen to sounds and and the mind continues to to feel more safe in the structures of self and the structures of the world uh, and that kind of replication and rehearsing of it. And how frustrating, you know, that can be as a yogi sometimes. But also you know, as we often try to encourage, it's it's important to recognize the the incredible value of that in the mind and, and the power of it, as well as, of course, the sides of it that are feel oppressive, you know, internally. So I was just uh, traveling and I went to visit my 94 year old grandfather in Ohio. Uh, my mom was out there. She's spending about two weeks a month out there to help take care of him. And my aunt lives there. And so she's, you know, very much involved and in kind of really being responsible for a lot of his daily kind of well-being. And in, in many ways, he's he's doing pretty well. But his his mind is less and less able to... depend on these structures of identity and of position and placement and meaning that we can take for granted or resent, you know, even, right? Especially as yogis. And it's hard for him, you know, it's, I think it's, there's many ways that this kind of thing can happen to people, of course, as we all know. Um, he's aware of it, right? He's aware that there's times where he doesn't really understand where he is and, and that it's it's frustrating, you know, that this is um, home, right? This is where he is. And, um, and then, and then his sense of himself also, right, is, um, not as the structure is just not as solid you know as it feels for for many of us and so um there's you know confusion and um 
and underneath that some anxiety and, and worry and stress and um and it is amazing you know that the whether from age and it just, the, you can see the amount of energy it takes to keep these structures of ourself in place right that this constant rehearsal that we're doing and composing of ourselves that really it takes a ton of energy and that sometimes it's just a matter of not having the energy to do that sometimes it's the mechanisms of mind are broken of course disease can play a major role in that but it was poignant you know to um you know to be there was an afternoon where it was like so beautiful you know in the living room and sort of lemony sunlight was coming in through the windows and it was kind of windy out and the all the autumn leaves of colors and the shadows of the leaves were on the ground and it was something like it was so quiet in the house and kind of just these sort of like very magical perfect sort of fall <laughs> autumn you know, afternoon moments. And um, and I could see that he was just very anxious. You know, there, there wasn't a sense of like being kind of permeated by the beauty <laughs> or, the, or the quietude of it. It was like, he just, um, you know, he just w didn't understand what was going on, you know, and, and it was frustrating. Um, and the sense of, you know, where is the, he's like, I don't, you know, the, I don't understand like what's going on with the organization and, and like, or the company, you know, the, the you know, they, they say I'm in charge, but, you know, I really don't feel like I know what's going on. And, you know, shouldn't there be a report, you know, of like our position and, and what's happening. And, you know, I don't understand what we're doing and what's our plan of attack, for lack of a better word, you know. And, you know, there is, there's no company, right? There's no organization. But to understand the sense of, like, the metaphor of structure and purpose and direction, there's something missing, right? There's, a, there's an inability to conjure that and um, find sort of solidity in that. And then at the same time, an inability to be interested in, in the lack of that being present, uh, uh, an inability to f sort of be, to rest in the lack of certainty and clarity. And um, even, you know, of course, what's poignant is with, you know, loved ones or in a beautiful autumn afternoon. And so, you know, we see that this, this, like when the, we use these patterns of thought and view and opinion and belief to, to constantly structure who we are and, and how we are in the world, even in negative ways, right? It's not, uh, but that, that solidity, that certainty of whether it's positive or negative of who we are and what we're facing and what we're supposed to be doing, it provides something there. And when that's gone, um, you know, often all we have is the patterns of anxiety or love or worry or peace or um, wanting or aversion, control, letting go, tranquility, you know, whatever are the deeper patterns, emotional patterns that we might have cultivated, right? Not just the content of thought, but like how how much do we understand the world of mind state of, of what's going on underneath these thoughts and what kind of relationship do we have with those? And when we don't have certain tools at our disposal to avoid them or to manipulate them, you know, they're just, that's what's left, you know, and it's, it's one of these things where, you know, it's, it's amazing on retreats or teaching many people, this question of anatta, of non-self, it's like, we treat it as if it's this like mysterious kind of esoteric 
like, what is this? So we get Anicca, we get Dukkha, but Anatta, you know, we get impermanence, we get suffering, but non-self feels so... But it's like if you've ever spent any time with anyone with Alzheimer's or in a nursing home or just an elder where it's like there's just not that ability to like compose the idea of themselves and reassert that, then anatta is like entirely obvious, right? That these things are fictions. There's nothing inherently real about them. And when they dissipate and we can't conjure them, there's still existence, right? We're still there. And there's other patterns that are underlying around emotion, around, of course, body. And, um, but there's nothing mysterious about non-self when you're with someone who doesn't remember who they are. I remember when my father was dying, um, and I think I've, you know, told parts of this story before of when I, we, I first got and got home and it was clear that this was happening, but he was still, you know, sort of with it and he had a brain tumor. And so it was very much kind of had started to impact his cognition and his mind. And, um, he had had it for many years, almost 16 years or so, you know, it was a long process, but this was like the end and it became clear. And I remember saying to him, you know, as like sort of arrived and as he was kind of getting ready for this journey, you know, he was about to go on. Just, just getting that as a yogi, I, I understood that things were probably going to get weird for him. <laughs> you know, like you go, you sit enough and, things kind of fall apart and are bizarre and unfamiliar and not how you, how we tend to keep reasserting them in our minds. Um, and that that was okay, that he should expect that things might start to get strange <laughs> in terms of his perception and, and, and his, um, yeah, perception of what's going on. And that to the best he could, you know, that to, and that we would help encourage and, re and remind him of love, you know, that of the things he loved and the people he loved and that he was loved and the people around him loved him, you know, that, that when we start to lose, and this is part of the Dhamma framework, is that things like love and wisdom are providing a structure that allows us a sense of safety when these fabricated structures start to dissipate, right? The structures of self. And then we, we understand that the reason that we're so s fixed on ourselves and, and keep solidifying these things is, is out of security, right? Is out of fear of the unknown and fear of the uncontrollability of things and non-self and impermanence, right? So this, this composure that we are so deeply invested in and that the Buddha, you know, liberated himself from this, this famous phrase when he, you know, became awakened. He said, house builder, you are seen, right? Your rafters have been broken. You shall build this house no more, right? I've, I've attained the unconditioned. The sense of the security in the unconditioned and not needing things to be one way or another is what provided the, the safety of not needing to keep re recreating this structure, this home, this house of self and of the world. But that actually we need that safety in order to do it. Otherwise we're just fighting ourselves out of aversion, fighting the mind out of wanting something else. And so the sense of don't, you know, to remember that you're loved and, and that you love things and that that love might be some kind of sanctuary, some kind of stability you know, or can can you be interested? Can you be curious about the strange phenomena that may start to arise, or the incoherence, or the um, disorientation that might be there? But that's very hard to do when you're about to die. <laughs> if you've never done it before, it's like that's a tall order, right? Uh, and so good on all of us to be 
at it before we're at that point. Um, because it is very hard to do when things are basically fine, never mind with the normal, you know, hardships of daily life and the hardships of just existence and whatever our particularities might be. We see this, you know, the, the challenge of this training, of this mental training, emotional training, physical training, um, to be with experience and its uncontrollability and, and to um, be interested in phenomena as, as solid and as familiar as they are or as weird and unfamiliar and distorted as they might seem at times. In the sense of being interested, right? Being curious, wanting to understand, having some faith and love and compassion and kindness and generosity and all these beautiful qualities of heart that we try to cultivate. How important it is to be building, building that tendency. So really, you know, it's mostly just sort of two things. The and and I will say in both in terms of my father and my grandfather, and my grandmother, you know, and my grandmothers when they passed away. Um, remembering that, like, conceptually, sometimes a conversation can help ease someone's dis-ease with the distortions of, of losing a sense of self and the kind of framework of orientation. But often they can't, you know, often it's, it's still kind of conceptual or you're, you're saying, remember, this is your grandson or remember, blah, 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 and it's like, it's not matching. And so that, that sometimes these things can kind of create more tension, you know, more, um, disorientation, more disease, uh, more anxiety when they come in the sort of conceptual form, you know. And it's such an important place where like physical contact is really important, you know, where it's like, you know, expressions of love can be one thing that might sometimes really be felt and heard and received, but also just like physical touching, you know. Um, I just remember, you know, like massaging my dad's feet and the sense of like physical contact that felt so important, you know, and, and reassuring and, and stabilizing. Or my grandfather, it's like, oh, getting, you know, when he's sitting down, this sort of like, you know, giving him a little massage on his back or scratching his back and the sense of like, oh, like that it, something that feels good physically is actually relaxing to the body and can help relax the mind. And that's important for ourselves as well, you know, and Michelle will often encourage when we're doing the metta practice, right, to, to make that physical connection with yourself, with your chest, your heart center, wherever your hands are touching, touching the body, the sense of like, can, can that physical contact be a reminder of care, of tenderness, so that in the anxiety and the worry, it's like the, st the stability can be provided through care, through connection. How important that is for each one of us, you know, and for anyone we encounter. And then, you know, in terms of the practice, to remember that... Um, there is a way, of course, that we and the Buddha and the tradition has framed practice as a kind of clarity of knowing, right? So mindfulness as knowing what's happening, you know, mindfulness as the labeling, oh, pressure, tension, warmth, coolness, um, right? This, this idea that by putting a gentle mental note, we... Um, we are less disturbed, right? Because there's a there's a there's a relationship with what we're experiencing directly, and there's a knowing of that, and there's something solid in that. Even as it starts to break up the conceptual frame of who we are, 
is allowed to break up because it's like, well, we know warmth and pressure and tension, wanting, not wanting, that there's an ease that can come from that and how important that is. Uh, you know, we talk about clear comprehension, right, in all its forms and formations. This, um, what that provides in terms of stability. And at the same time, to know that there is also a stability beyond that kind of knowing that's also important, right? That that the the names, the clarity, the, the certainty that we look for in our practice a lot of the times, oh, just, you know, wanting more clarity, wanting to see what's going on, wanting to understand, um, that also that can be a, a trap, that can be a, a another level of structure that we become identified with and dependent upon that is also ultimately not stable. And so there's there's a, a value in our practice of also dropping kind of below that. I think Steve mentioned last week in his um, talk about like this, is it mindfulness or is it sort of subtle thought? That's a it's a very interesting question and a, and a very kind of powerful thing to kind of look at in your practice of like where can you start to just start allow thoughts to be actually less clear. The mindfulness actually is stronger sometimes when the thoughts are less clear and they're ha- they're actually happening more quickly and more strangely and are less definable, less coherent than we tend to recognize them as. And that can be, a, again, a kind of scary or unsettling sort of thing to do to, to sort of just let thoughts be very kind of abstract and strange and undefined and, and incoherent. Um, and to see that there is actually this kind of current stream of thinking that's happening that we're not always so identified with. It might be more dreamlike. It might be even more broken up than that. Um, but where can we allow things to be less familiar, actually, as another flavor of mindfulness that is more relaxed, that's more comfortable with not knowing what's happening, with things being outside of the framework of our understanding? It's like sometimes I know it's like, you know, we'll offer something and there's questions about like, well, the, you know, the, the Dhamma and the, the Buddha's teachings that are, you know, the, these lists and these frameworks and the, you know, Taka and Vichara and the, you know, the, what's happening in a moment of contact and Vedana and all these like things, these structures of, of teaching that are very important and very helpful about us understanding. And then there's the side of it that's like, where can we get too caught up and fixed on like, as if, if we understood that intellectually perfectly, that that is somehow going to help us deal with the instability of reality, right? The undefinability of so much of phenomena that's arising and passing out of our control. I had um, my radio show today. I did all um, cover songs of Leonard Cohen. And I was reminded of this song that um, I'll share a few stanzas. It's uh, one of his more contemporary pieces, Steer Your Way. Steer your way past the ruins of the altar and the mall. Steer your way through the fables of creation and the fall. Steer your way past the palaces that rise above the rot, year by year, month by month, day by day, thought by thought. Steer your heart past the truth that you believed in yesterday, such as fundamental goodness and the wisdom of the way. Steer your heart, precious heart, past the people whom you bought year by year, month by month, day by day, thought by thought. this notion that even these uh, structures of our practice and of our path 
are sometimes things that we need to let go of in order to get to a deeper truth, a deeper relaxation, uh, a deeper peace, you know, with the unconditioned um, is just important. You know, it's important now in our, our practice. It'll be important when, you know, when we wake up in, in the middle of the night and don't know where we are or who we are, or if we're, you know, fortunate enough to live to an age where we can't remember those things in general, that it won't bother us, right? That it's the sense of like, oh, these are just all these, you know, palaces and fantasies and constructions in the mind that have their place and have their beauty and have their wonderful qualities, but that actually we don't need them to be solid or stable or reaffirmed in order to feel safe, in order to feel a sense of connection or love. Um, you know, that we can simply abide in an afternoon of sunlight and shadow and not worry about needing to make anything of it, conjure anything out of it, and find our peace there. And even if we can't, that's okay. They have Ativan now and morphine, you know, that really are like really helpful for a lot of people. <laughs> But I think even, I will say this, it's like, even if we're anxious when we die, you know, which is like, there's probably, there's going to be a decent chance, <laughs> you know, that um, we have practiced this being interested, Right, this sense of like, oh wow, this is really strange, or this is really different. That this muscle of mindfulness, of curiosity, of investigation, is um, something that just gets stronger. And that the more we have that, it doesn't matter if we're at peace or not in those last moments, because we can be interested. And that that will bec that becomes a habit. It becomes a, a deep tendency of, of personality, of being, of these undercurrents that are beyond thought and sort of structures of self, this, this tendency to just keep being interested and investigate, that that is more important than the experience, right? Just as it is in our sitting right now, just as it is when we're on retreat or in our day, it's the ability to be mindful of the experience and interested and curious and investigative. That's more important than the quality of the experience, right? This, is it pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, which is out of our control. And that that we can have faith in, right? That that, that habit of mind is we're building it moment by moment, you know, retreat by retreat, sitting by sitting. And at any time, you know, in our lives, we're, we're able to step back and be like, oh, I'm really caught up in something. It's like, what is that? What's going on? Being interested, curious, genuinely interested. And of course, the patterns of love and um, wisdom, compassion, appreciative joy. All of these things, you know, we're, we're digging these channels so that they are the natural response to whatever is happening in the heart, mind, and body. The wind is, or somebody is opening and closing my door. Sorry. <laughs> mm. So thank you all today. And um, we, as usual, have some time for questions if anyone has them, the little reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen should have a raise hand button. Um, and uh, that's our easiest way of finding out if you have a question. Otherwise, you can just say, type in the chat that you have a question and we'll, we'll call on you as well.
Hi, Arlene. Oh, hold on. I might not have un. Yes, you can unmute. I just want to say that your talk was incredible. In 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 terms of, um, I I I can't be specific, and and I just want to say thank you. Uh, and thank you. I want to thank you and Michelle and Stephen for being here. Uh, I am am so in awe of the talk that you gave, uh, not only in terms of your individual experiences with your grandfather, but how you brought it together. And for me, as someone who doesn't, you know, know the one, two, three of, uh, of this and the A, B, C of that and the D, E, F of that, and I've lived my life uh, kind of recognizing that even if I knew it and you told me, you know, I don't need aisle signs to know that it's gonna be out of here in five seconds, but in, for somebody who has been practicing for 33 years uh, under very different kinds of living situations, I just want to say that you and Stephen and Michelle, that this talk, uh, you know, I hope that you post it somewhere where other people, uh, you know, people who just go on Vipassana Hawaii or, or something else where they get to hear it. Thank you. I, th I think I, I want to just say that to not, I don't mean to, um, I really don't mean to deny how scary it is to let go of or to feel like we're losing these things in our minds and um, these structures, you know. I, there was a, I remember in high school, there was a record I had, it was called the mind is a terrible thing to taste. And I thought that that as a, as a young, as a yogi, I've, I've really come to see that there's, um, we so need to respect the, the tensions that are keeping us together and the, to honor the, the anxieties and the fears and the, um, that feel like it's keeping us kind of composed because it feels so scary, you know, to to die or to sleep or to not be in control, you know, or to lose our minds, you know, and and to to really feel like that's legitimate fear and to and and to really understand why it takes so long for this practice to unfold and develop and come into fruition it's like the patience you know that we all need to just really be okay with the mind being tight and clenched you know and but being but being in relationship with it and caring and and being a good companion to that so that the slowly the ease you know builds and it can open and close and open and close and we're not sort of trying to force or push that agenda on um yeah i feel you know just yeah so appreciative of all the teachings we've received you know to be able to understand that julia hello 
Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Um, so I should probably ask a, a, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm like, I should probably ask a practice question and that would benefit everyone. This is like personal curiosity question. Um, have you guys ever met a, like a really long time monastic that has dementia? Because like I've met, lay people that get dementia and I've I've met at least one lay person who gets dementia who has a very strong personality and was kind of funny about it but you could see that the depth of practice was also there and I, I just got to thinking like I've never met a monk or a nun who like loses their mind completely and I don't know if that's because if you get famous, your sangha protects you and doesn't let other people know, or like, <laughs> I'm just curious if, if any of you guys have met. Anyway, yeah, that's all. Thank you for your practice and sharing. Yeah. I don't know, Steve or Michelle, do you? I do have a little story about Mahagosananda, but you guys. Steve, you've met more monks and nuns than a all of us. <laughs> they also get dementia. Some of the senior Nayaka Sayadas at Mahasi Center were very old and loved and unable to cognize things at times or handle their physical functions. So younger monks or nuns, if it was a nun, would literally carry them around. Ajahn Chah oh, uh, yeah. had dementia as he was passing away okay. uh, in the Thai tradition. So it doesn't seem to take exception to, okay. you know, this, the body deteriorates. If we have a body, it deteriorates. Thank you, Stephen. I remember on a recent retreat telling a story and a talk about a time where I had met uh, Mahagosananda. It was quite a few years ago at this point, who was a Cambodian monk, very renowned and respected as a kind of peace activist and reconciliation worker. And, he, at the end of his life, was in Western Massachusetts and had some students taking care of him. And I met him at a Buddhist Peace Fellowship kind of gathering. And I was just amazed by his lack of, um, his cognitive kind of function had kind of, you know, my, to my understanding, had really almost, you know, really disappeared in terms of recollection or understanding in kind of concrete terms what was happening. but his presence was so lovely and his demeanor was really beautiful and kind and engaged. And it was very impactful for me, you know, the sense that really seeing how you could lose so much and yet the practice still there as a fundamental baseline. And then it was interesting what a student at that retreat mentioned that she knew him around the same time or had encountered him or was familiar with other students of his. I can't remember exactly the details, but that he had hard times, you know, that there also were times where he was disoriented and dis uncomfortable and grouchy and, you know, a human being. And um, that he, he still had the, you know, full range of um, human experiences that we might relate to, you know, and there was something very beautiful about it and there was also something very normal about it. Yeah, Michelle. I don't think I want to talk about that many personal experiences I've had, but as much as um, across the board, the monks and nuns that I 
was around that practiced a lot of the Brahma Vihara were um, incredibly inspiring at the end of their lives with whatever body, mind, karma they had. So that like, I think that you have to live out your karma if you take birth and we all have a body, mind, karma that we will all individually um, face, um, whether it's the loss of our body more than the loss of our mind or the loss of our mind more than the body or, or the bo both, if you have that body karma, body and mind karma. Um, but I think that again, like Sayada Ulakana did so much metta and Deepama did so much metta, um, the happy Sayada. I mean, we, when we would all visit him in Burma, he would, he would just say, I can't see, I can't hear, I can't walk, which literally he was being carried he couldn't walk and it's like he's like ha 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 you know just like he was the most amazing really to see go through it so what what you will hear from all of us is to practice the brahma vihara thank you yeah. Yeah. and thank you um, I've been, you know, just recently, um, I've been sort of toying with the idea of kind of inviting this kind of dissolution, you might call it, through some of the new, you know, psychedelic drugs, and uh, which I have not experienced in like 50 years. You know, <laughs> and I admit the idea. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. But somebody the other day, you know, said to me, "Oh, I have these psychedelic mushrooms. I'm going." And they're really. And I said, "Like, oh, can you give me some?" And he said, "Oh, yes." Yeah. So he brought me this bag that I've been sitting in a drawer for like several months. And I'm like, hmm, you know. But it it sort of makes me think, you know, it's like kind of a rehearsing this kind of. Um, falling apart experience, you know, it kind of, there's some ways it seems like maybe it might be interesting, you know, preparation. I don't know. Just, I hope this is appropriate, but I just really curious what your thoughts on this. You know? I still feel like I don't have that much time left to, uh, you know, get all my practice to ripen and complete, you know, it's, it seems like boy, it might speed things up. I don't know. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> I don't know, Steve, if you have any thoughts. I have some. Um, I think it's helpful to keep in mind that practice isn't on a time trajectory. It's, it's really timeless. Uh, so regardless of our age, our aging process, our, our beginning to lose some of our physical or mental capacities, it doesn't matter. The, the force behind all our practice is a karma called parami. And they're developed every time we're mindful, and they've also been developed uh, f from the timeless past. That's what always comes forward for us in, in the moment and when we really need it, close to or at our last breath. Now, I've been asked, we've been asked these questions numerous times over the decades. Um, in, in, one, <clears throat> in one retreat I was actually doing a lot of Brahma Vihara concentration practices and in, in one of them I, I made a resol resolve to re-experience 
the numerous psychedelics I had done in my 20s, and, and which I did re-experience. And it just had no comparison whatsoever to the quality of mind that I used to make that resolve and the quality and that quality of mind that was uh, nurturing the wisdom trajectory of the timeless wisdom trajectory. Because we've seen it happen in the past, we often ad advise people to take real care because all the work they've done um, without depending on any external thing. Uh, and like maybe the first time I tried a psychedelic, I heard from Alan Watts, when you get the message, you hang up the phone. Mm. And it made so much sense to me that I, I did not thereafter depend on on psychedelics to to move my spiritual practice along. I'm not saying that I have any absolute idea or uh, judgment about that at all. But we have seen people uh, doing numerous 90-day, you know, three-month retreats with us in the 20 years that we taught them on the East Coast. Uh, and then at a certain point, they got into some of those medicine circles. And when they came back to practice like another 90-day retreat, I just say they, they seem wired a little differently. <clears throat> and so I, I don't have a clear response, certainly not a biological or chemical <clears throat> response. I would, I would just, for me, my caution to people is um, this process is so deep and so internal and has so much Dhamma intelligence. Would you want to risk it in any way? Yeah. Catalina? I agree, your talk was so, so beautiful and so touching. Um, especially about the no self. <coughs> it is it really, I, it, for me, it's, 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 a, um, it's, it's a goal. A, a goal. I, like, I, I want to arrive to that place of liberation, of, of not. Uh, having my personality be um, um, that I know is just um, consequences of of my education of so of of so much as um, superficial in a way superficial things. So um, what is happening is that I'm, I'm living in two 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 trails, you know, like. One is my capacity of being able to uh, lean in the breath and knowing that the breath is a protector, is a healer. Um, it's um, a place of really, really um, peace and quietness. And my other one is my um, being in connection with the world and being in connection with uh, doing things good for right now right now in the is i am the field of the environment and trying to um to get resolutions against global warming against uh, climate change and finding um the resistance and the um, um almost um block of people that denial i don't want to hear about that and uh, almost hate you know like and don't come and talk and 
to me about this is this is my right my right to do whatever i want in my space and with my burning all these kind of things like ah so it's like a uh, it's hard for me very very hard for me to try to do something as a human um and at the same time i know that i have this other space that is so safe and um and there there is several things that come a little bit anger uh, of being being feeling that i because i am an, a woman and um i'm not in a position of power mm. i always see see the, the the thing about um sorry say men but usually they want so much power that they they don't want to um they don't want to see any change and they don't want to give live um, their 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 rights the uh, freedom to do whatever they want so um <laughs> It's funny, like it's like the non-self. Like I have myself, a self that want to come and impose, not not impose, but really make a change. And um, so um, it's hard. It's really hard, hard, hard um, to be able to do things. Um, no, so that's uh, I don't know, like. Um, any any suggestion, especially to call my 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 myself in a sense of like a, this is a long long uh, road and this is a I am doing I am fighting conditions of like a, a, you know the uh, all the oil companies all the uh, advertisement all these things billions and billions invested in getting people to behave certain ways so like me catalina i was feeling so much compassion about for me of me little catalina trying to go fight all these people and all these ways so um yeah i don't know any comments about this thank you yeah i can start i mean i am um... I think there's probably lots of aspects of what you described that probably many people here can relate to, you know, if whether all of them or individual parts. I mean, I think that it's a it's wonderful to see how clear you are in these um the different elements of what are challenging in terms of these interactions, whether it's the the, no, the ideas and the frameworks that you know are true in the world or your direct personal interactions with other people that are difficult for all of the reasons you described. Um, and then like the sanctuary of your breath and where is, the, where is that, how does that translate? How does that inform, you know, and, and you know, be a part of that? Um, you know, I know, you know, Steve may have more to say as well. So, um, you know, we'll sometimes take different angles on these these questions, but I, I think I'll start in a, one place, which is around my story with my grandfather, which is one of the things that was very humbling was of course, when we're with family, to see patterns that you don't like, but you know you also do, <laughs> right? These, and, and so to see like some of the things with my grandfather or with my mom or my aunt or whatever, like just behaviors around difficulties or behaviors around whatever that are deep patterns that we also have integrated from our own um, uh, context, you know, and tr training and cultivation, you know, um, and so there is something very humbling about that experience, but important. And I think part of what I feel like is helpful in terms of the practice is when we start to 
there's the breath and there is like the, the sanctity of that sanctuary that you're describing and the concentration and the protection and the purity of that. And there is, you know, opening up to other parts of our experience, right? How are we mindfulness of, of the heart, right? And, and wanting and of anger and of uh, fear and of the thing, some of the things that you're describing. But I do think that there is something fundamentally important about the people we think of as our enemies. Uh, and I'm, you didn't use that language, but I'll use that language because there are people I think of as our enemies. And so uh, th this sense of being very careful with that experience of feeling like someone is our enemy, that they are the, if only they would go away or if only we could get rid of them or you could just force them to, to, to be powerless, right? Or force them to agree or be to your perspective, which you know is right. It's like we have to get that that is a position, it's an orientation that we don't value in someone else, right? That we see that that's problematic when someone else is acting that way, that they just want what they want and that they're going to enforce it no matter what and they don't care about anyone else and, and they would rather kill you than actually have to deal with, with the complication you're bringing up. These are real forces in the world, right? And to understand that they are not just outside of ourselves, that they are not just these other people do this and, and we are the sort of holy ones with our integrity and righteousness to understand that we also have unwholesome feelings towards other people that we see as obstacles, that we see as frustrating. And that if we can't recognize that on some degree and accept our anger and our hatred and our frustration, our sadness and our fear, as much as our love, right? We might aspire to be love all beings and to be compassionate and to understand, gosh, this, these people must have been formed in some kind of fire that made them this way, right? That's very painful. We can sometimes get there, but there is something about that direct experience of ourselves of like not feeling like these are other in that way that I, I also do this. I also understand this kind of aversion, this kind of wanting to dominate, wanting to control, uh, wanting to disregard that that can open up the beginning of a process that's very different around coming to understanding with other people of, on, of a conversation maybe more about values about what we care about about pain what 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 spheres we have so that like we can't always talk about the object that we're trying to fix that sometimes it, the conversation needs to come down to something that's maybe more shared and that it's a slower process and that's part of what's hard it's like Violence is a shortcut to understanding, right? If we can't come to understanding, then we need to basically enforce our position and win. And these people will lose and we will win and that will be the thing we're aiming for. And I, I don't mean to say that there aren't times where winning isn't important. Uh, as we say, you know, some weeks before uh, the election. But also to see that like there is something also about that perspective that is not the whole picture. There is something about human connection and coming to understanding and, and collaborate. Like what is the potential of actually like building collaboration and building um, uh, a world together and making decisions about a lake or a river or a, a park or things like that with different shareholders and different stakeholders um, who may really disagree that there are ways to do that. You know, there are processes where it's like really like all of us kind of coming down from our agendas and our views and our perspectives that we might feel very identified with and, and might be right, but the rightness doesn't actually lead to a process that, that is going to create a sustainable future for everyone. And that's part of the hardship of what you're describing. And I think what many of us feel, it's like there's an urgency with climate change, there's an urgency with racial justice, there's an urgency with all kinds of things. And it's not to say the urgency isn't real. And to know that like throughout history, it's like you have to win and then keep winning and keep winning and keep winning and keep enforcing uh, a perspective on people who might not disagree in order to kind of stabilize something. And that 
ultimately leads to violence. There's not really a way around it because um, we do it internally. And it's, it's, so it's, it's a very hard thing to kind of come to terms with. And so what I would just say as like a wrapping up of a long thing, sometimes we think of concentration as the enforcement and mindfulness as the process of understanding. So that you create the context of love and kindness, of, of the protection of concentration around your breath that you described. And that is, a, that is like a, we're doing this, we're controlling this space, and there's a safety in that. And you see how valuable that is, how important that is, and necessary at times. But that you can't actually do it all the time. You can't sustain that level of control all the time. You have to let it go, and then there's the wildness of the mind, of the heart, of the body, and of human interaction. And so you have to have this dance of when are you controlling through concentration and when are you investigating and open to disappointment and conflict and things not being the way we want them to be with mindfulness and understand that it's a balance and it's, a, it's something that we're rehearsing in our practice. When do we rely on concentration to provide the stability or loving kindness or all of the Brahma Viharas? When does wisdom provide the stability because we're in relationship that is honest and true. And that there is a metaphor in that for society as well, where it's like, where do we lay down a law that needs to create the basics of stability and safety? And then where do we also let go of that level of control so that we can then be in honest conversation? Or does the, the honesty and the wisdom, the mindfulness needs to happen in the context of some control of safety? Um, so it's a it's an open-ended answer, but to say that there is there are lessons that we learn in our practice about how we relate to individuals and how we might think about a bigger picture of of social change and social dynamics around change and um, all of these things that feel so important right now. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Just another Sunday. Mm. Well, I don't know, Steve, Michelle, we call it a day. Seem okay. Everyone, take care of yourselves. Enjoy the Hallow's Eve. Dia de los Muertos. All Saints Day. It's a powerful time we're in. So take care of yourselves and each other. <coughs> Happy Day of the Dead. Mm. Oh, thank you. Mm.